Good morning. Welcome to True Light Church. I'm Pastor Keith, and I'm really glad that you're joining us this morning. I know it seems like hard to believe that it's the month of May already, and so here we are once again online uh, worshiping together as a church. And so I'm going to mix things up a little bit differently this morning. I'm going to open up in prayer, and then there's going to be an opening video to get our heart and mind focused upon the Lord this morning. And then we have a special guest worship team with us leading us in worship. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this morning. God, we know that you want to accomplish great and amazing things in our heart and our mind, God. And you don't want us to be uh, pulled by any of the outward things that are going on in our world and our life around us. God, you want us fixated and focused, uh, finding our joy and our strength and our hope in who you are. So speak to us this day. Help us to worship you. Help us to focus upon you. And you're worthy of all of this time and effort and energy we're putting into even just having this time together. So God, you be lifted up in everything that's done. In Jesus' name, amen. Life is fragile. It's a fact we're learning in real time, every day. What we once called normal seemingly disappeared. There's uncertainty in the air, restlessness in our hearts. Things we once took for granted are becoming difficult to find. Our usual day-to-day has evolved into this odd chaos. Peace is becoming obsolete. Many have lost jobs, security, and those they love. The pain is undeniable. But what if our fragility caused us to lean harder into God? What if, in our weakness, we chose to rely more on His strength? Would our outlook change? Would the peace that passes understanding begin to drown out the noise of this moment? Would we walk in a quiet confidence, knowing our God is mighty to save, We're not promised tomorrow, but we are given a simple truth to stand on. Our God goes before us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Yes, life is fragile, but in our weakness, He is strong. Well, hello, church. We count it a great privilege to be with you, to worship with you um, and your church. I'm just going to read from John chapter 4, 23. Jesus said, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for their Father is seeking such people to worship him. You know, it came after just a moment when the Samaritan woman said, But don't you Jews say you're meant to worship in the temple? Jesus was saying, it doesn't matter where you worship from, it matters about the state of your heart. That's where worship comes from. That's what the Father's looking for. So today, whether you're in a living room, whether you're outside, no matter where you are, we just love the fact that we can worship together. We don't need to be in a church building. We are the church. So let's just choose to worship God despite our circumstances. You know, Jesus didn't say to worship in feelings and circumstance but he said in spirit and in truth. So let's sing together. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will find you home. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore. doubts in my failures you won't walk out your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled 
see Whoa, oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea In the silence, in the silence you won't let go In the questions your truth will hold Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Oh, oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea See this faithfulness, my lighthouse My lighthouse, shining in the darkness I will find you, oh, my lighthouse My lighthouse, I will trust the promise You will carry me safe to shore
sorry, folks. We're socially distant right now. So we can't do things uh, exactly the way that we would if we were there with you in person. That doesn't mean we're not gonna make a wee effort here to have a little bit of Irish shin diggery. That's a real word, look that up. Why don't you get your arm around whoever you've got near you right now, whoever your lockdown partners are, why don't you just uh, get your arm around them, give them a wee snuggle, and uh, let's celebrate the kingdom of God together. We're still doing this thing, even in the middle of this weird moment. We're still building the kingdom of God. We believe he still has plans for us to prosper us, not to harm us. That's worth celebrating. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and our might have worked out by now we're big believers in joy we believe in the truth of scripture we believe that the joy of the Lord is our strength let's lift up that truth over our circumstances right now let's sing it out come on though the tears may fall my song will rise my song will rise to you Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. Though the world is rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you, Lord. Singing for joy, come on. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness, I'll dance. In the shadows, I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. When I cannot see you with my eyes, let faith arise to you. Though I cannot feel your hand in mine, let faith arise to you. God of mercy and love, I will praise you, Lord. We worship you, I you shine with glory, Lord of life, feel alive with you. In your presence now I come alive, I am alive with you. There is strength when I say. Sing it out. The joy of the Lord is my strength wherever you are. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing it. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Let's choose joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the
Yes, Father, we're singing that in confidence, the kind of confidence that we have whenever we sing straight from your word, knowing that it never returns void, that there's always power in the words of scripture. We just recognize that this verse, the joy of the Lord is our strength, is so much more than self-help or anything like that. This isn't just a positive mindset, but this is supernatural power spoken in your word, anchored for all eternity. When the enemy says I'm done, I lift my praises. When my world comes crashing down, I lift my praises high. See the darkness turns to dawn, I live my praises. I choose to worship, I choose you now. Yeah, when the enemy says I'm done, I live my praises. When my world comes crashing down, I live my praises high. Till the darkness turns to dawn, I lift my praises. I choose to worship. I choose you now. Let's choose him, church. I choose to worship, I choose to bow. Though there's pain in the offering, I lay it down. Here in the conflict, when doubt surrounds. Though my soul is unraveling, I choose you now. I will praise you through the fire, through the storm and through the flood. There is nothing that could ever steal my soul. In the valley, you are worthy. You are good when life is not. You will always and forever be my soul. I build my altar right here and now. And in the midst of the darkest night, it won't burn out. For you are perfect, no matter what. In the joy of the suffering, I sing it loud. I will praise you through the fire, through the storm and through the flood. There is nothing that could ever steal my soul. In the valley, you are worthy. You are good when life is not. You will always and forever be my soul. Let's choose it right here and right now when the enemy says we're done when our world comes crashing down we've still got a song to sing in every season and circumstance we have a song to sing we won't let the enemy steal it we won't let our circumstances steal it he is still good when life is not that's our proclamation that's our declaration wherever we are let's declare it together that we choose to worship right here and right now when the enemy says I'm
Wasn't that a treat this morning? I'm sure some of you were surprised. How in the world did I get Ren Collective to lead worship for True Life Church? Well, that secret will remain with me unless you've been following them online. So uh, what I want to really share with you this morning is um, I, I love all, all of the songs that were sung this morning, but I want to focus in on one of them that mentions Scripture. It says, The joy of the Lord is our strength. And this comes from the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. Now, Nehemiah was building a wall to help uh, protect those that needed protection from outsiders. And um, towards the end of the book, there's this changeover from Nehemiah building the wall, and then Ezra starts reading the law out loud to the workers, to the people who are there. They're excited that this wall is being built, and then they start, Ezra starts to read God's law. And the people respond, hearing God's law being read. And they respond. And they, they respond with repentance, which means they're, they're turning their heart back to the Lord and realizing that, man, they had strayed away and they, they needed the Lord to be in their life. It wasn't just about a wall being built up. They needed their heart and their mind in the right place. I want to read to you Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. It says, Then Nehemiah the governor... Ezra the priest and teacher of the law and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And Nehemiah continued, Go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks and share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected and sad for the joy of the Lord is your strength. We've been working through this series called Essential, and I want to remind you again, the word essential means absolutely necessary. It's absolutely necessary that we find the joy of the Lord is truly our strength. It's not in outward circumstances, emotions, feelings, stuff, things. I think we're finding out that to be so much more true each and every day that we're going through this uh, time in our life. That this is not our source of joy, is all of these external things. This is one of the reasons it's Communion Sunday as a church we're going to celebrate in a little while. That this is one of the reasons we celebrate, just like these verses in Nehemiah said, this is a day not to have our head down, but to celebrate. And he reminds them, the joy of the Lord is your strength. I want to do that this morning. I want us to be reminded that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Remember what Jesus has done for you. Let the Bible stir up some joy in your heart this morning. We're going to hang out in the book of Philippians. It's sometimes considered the joy book. Uh, Paul, the apostle, mentions the word joy, depending on your translation, about 16 times over four different chapters. That's quite a bit of many times being reminded about joy and joyfulness. And so towards the end of the book, in Philippians chapter 4, he exhorts the church in Philippi. And the word exhort means to urge, to advise, or to caution earnestly. And we're going to end this time of reading the Bible. We're going to go backwards in a little bit in the book of Philippians and see the source of Paul's joy. But I want to read first Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. He exhorts this group of people, and here's what he says. He urges them to listen to what he has to say. Chapter uh, 4, Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Now realize, Paul's in prison. Why would he have a reason to rejoice? Yet he's telling them to rejoice. It's kind of, put it in modern context, it's someone right now, in the hospital, suffering with a sickness, and they're telling you, rejoice in the Lord. And and, and I love this quote about joy, that our inner attitudes do not have to reflect our outward circumstances. And that's what joy is. Joy doesn't mean just being happy and putting on a smile for everybody, but there's a contentment, a joy that no matter what's going on outside, the Lord can be your joy and your strength and keep you grounded. Realize uh, that this continues on this exhortation. Verse 5 says, Let your gentleness be evident to all. 
the Lord is near. Now, this isn't just a, you better, Jesus is watching, but it's so much more than that. Think about the opposite of the word gentle. So it says, let your gentleness be evident to all. And so don't let your rough, rude, coarse, or fierceness be known to all. And sometimes, let's be honest, even in this time, we've, we've been quarantined, we've been staying uh, away, and, 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 and our schedules are messed up. We, this can come out real easily, especially around our family and the people we've been, we've been, we, we, we feel maybe stuck with, that we can be a little coarse and rude and rough around the edges. So this verse is saying, let your gentleness be evident to all. There's no need to be any other way because Jesus is with us. So it's not Jesus is watching. It's be gentle, be calm, be the opposite of rough, rude, and coarse because Jesus is near. He's got this. Again, if you're not part of our Wednesday night Bible study, I strongly encourage you. It's been just just a great time walking through very slowly Psalm 23. And we were reminded this week that Psalm 23 is that reminder in the valley of the shadow of death, that big reminder is first, he's with us. We're not alone. We're not going through it alone. And I love this uh, big truth that we always uncover at True Light. This verse says, let your gentleness be evident to all. All means, hopefully you filled in the blank, all. All means all. And so it's not picking and choosing, well, they weren't gentle to me, so I'm not going to be gentle back. No. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Verse 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. We all worry. We all have anxious thoughts. And at moments, we all have stress. The reality is, and, and it's hard to realize this reality, is worrying doesn't change anything. So Paul says, redirect this this anxiousness in a way that might actually be effective, might actually be productive. Pray and petition. Uh, I think of the word petition, right? When someone's petitioning, right? It's almost kind of like a protest. They, they might be standing outside a, a building and, 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 and not giving up. They, they are on strike and they are making their presence known every day, showing up keeping at it, not giving up, hopefully not an inflatable rat. And, and, but the idea is that they're not giving up. And, and so Paul's encouraging us as, as believers, don't give up. Pray and petition. Pray kind of gets our mind, or it should. Praying should get us in a, in a worshipful attitude that we're focused upon Jesus, not just rambling off a list. Oh, we talked about that. We talked about the Lord's Prayer a few weeks ago. But it's so much more than that. And it, what it should do is prayer should change us. It should ultimately transform us as we're drawn close to, to Jesus, that he is transforming us, making us more like him, that we start to think, well, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't have that attitude. And we start to pray differently and it changes us. It transforms us. It should get us focused on the person of Jesus, who he is, who he's like, how would he re- respond? What does he want me thinking about this situation? And so we get a new perspective. And, and it helps us to maybe even get into a place where we say, Lord, help me to be an answer to the even prayer that I'm praying. How can I, how can I maybe be an answer to that prayer that I'm praying? God, you know, work in this situation. Well, maybe the Lord's saying, I want you to work in this situation. I'm going to use you to work in that situation. So don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, pray and petition with thanksgiving. God, I'm grateful. Thank you for what you've done. And then present those requests to God. This Wednesday as a church is our time of prayer, so I encourage you to join us online. And we're going to pray for the different needs that are in our realm of influence, the people that we know, the things that we uh, come in contact with. Verse 7 goes on to say this, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I love this quote, True peace is not found in positive thinking, in absence of conflict, or in good feelings. It comes from knowing God is in control. And isn't that such a reality right now that we just have to sometimes sit back and say, all right, no more news briefs, no more headlines, no more articles. I just need to sit and breathe and say, okay, God, 
you've got this. There's more unknown in our life than ever before. We can't really even begin to plan anything um, too far into the future with any much assurity or details. And so we have to just sit back and say, okay, God is in control. And there's a peace that we're promised that passes understanding. And now please understand this. This is for those who we've already made peace with God. We've already accepted his grace and his forgiveness. So we've been washed clean. And so that is the one type of peace with God. I made my peace with God. And, and, but this is the, the walking in the peace daily when we face new situations and new things. No, my sins are forgiven. I'm not living like that way anymore. Uh, I know that. That peace is taken care of, but this is the daily peace as new anxieties and new stresses and new things might come up. I'm going to walk in this, the peace of God. And I love this idea. When our heart and mind are protected, that's what it is. It guards our heart and mind. And when our heart and mind are protected, we're able to do what these verses go on to say. This list that you're going to see, it's going to be easier. Paul is encouraging us to think then. Think on certain things. Look at verse 8 and 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whenever you, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. This is so, such a reality to, to be awakened to that what we think about, we often become. We often do. It's just the reality. And the more and more we dwell on something, uh, a certain way, a certain way of thinking, and, and, and we stew on it long enough, it affects us. And so let's break down these words that he says. And let's give them some definition because sometimes we can just gloss over and say, oh, that's a lovely list. Oh, okay, I just got to do some good stuff. And we don't really define what good really is. The word true means valid reliable, and honest. Hopefully pointing our attention and our mind to who God is. He's reliable. He's valid. He's honest. There's no falseness in who he is. The word noble means the quality that makes people worthy of respect. Um, and, and so there's that idea, again, that, that that's not always found in human terms. And so pointing our eyes, this is, this is the 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 top of the list, the, the things that we know, these are right, and there's no questioning that. The next word is right. Upright or just conforms to God's standards. Remember, not our standards. Oh, I think it's okay. No, no, no. This is God's standards. We know his, his ways are higher than our ways. And sometimes we have to be reminded of that. Is our mind thinking about that kind of stuff, or are we settling, letting our mind kind of drag through the gutters of, well, it's, it's okay, but it's not right. The idea of pure is moral purity. And let's be real honest. We know when something doesn't fit into that category, when something's not really that moral, it's not really that pure. We're like, well, it's not that bad. I've seen worse. I've heard worse. Well, no, we're not talking about that. We're talking about pure, like crystal clear water that's totally pure. And so the next word is lovely. Pleasing and agreeable. Not just to us, but to the, to, the, to the masses. And most people would agree upon that. And then admirable, praiseworthy, attractive, and true to the highest standard. Not the lowest standards. Well, you know, it was attractive to me. I, I wanted to do that, so that, that's good. No, no. Remember, all these words are working in tandem together. He, he says, whatever is pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, right, noble, true, all of this wrapped up on there, not just, well, I think about some noble things sometimes. No, no, no. You're thinking about all of these things, and the more that you think about them, it, it, we give this promise that the peace of God will be with us. And I want us to understand that, that, that when we, our thoughts are so important, those around us right now, what are they saying? What are they, what are they pumping into us? And I, and I don't just mean physically around us. A lot of us, we're on the Internet more than ever before right now. We're reading, we're absorbing. Are we copying that? Are we getting uh, that sort of attitude when we see certain people talk and we read certain blogs and articles? Is that affecting us? Is it affecting us? Are we getting a little jaded? Are we getting a little bitter? Are we getting a little... The list can go on and on. 
The reality is, as Paul's reminding us, get our thoughts on the right pattern, on the right place, and the peace of God will follow us. I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit that when my mind is straying from this list, he often wakes me up. And, he, and I don't have peace. I remember when we decided to move out to the North Fork, there was an opportunity to go uh, to uh, a, an already established church, and there were things there, and it, and it wasn't the area that we originally had prayed about, but it was offered. And of course, you know, you're, you, you, when you don't know all the details, you're kind of like, well, maybe that's good. And Claire and I prayed, it, and we didn't have a piece about it. Well, there was just, you know what, it, it, it wasn't bad, it wasn't sinful, it wasn't wrong, but there was no peace. And I wanted the peace of God more than anything, and I still want that. And so I encourage you that when we're making decisions, when you're making decisions, that we would say, God, I want your peace. I want to know that I'm filling this list in my mind of right, noble uh the, the good things that, that are not, I'm not going to get it clogged when I go to make a decision and I'm trusting you to lead me. And so um, I, I am grateful that the Holy Spirit steers us and that peace is one of the guiding factors when we know the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. And so I want to walk in that peace. And when I walk in that peace, what am I probably doing? I'm being obedient to God's word. I'm being obedient to his call on my life. And there is that peace of like, you know what? We're, I'm all good. God and I, we're at a good place. And, and I, I'm not hiding anything. And, and I'm able to hear from him clearly. And I know I'm doing what's pleasing him. Next part of this chapter, Philippians chapter 4. You probably, one of the verses in this uh, chapter uh, verses 10 through 13 are very well known, and I want to re- always want to read it in context. It's so, so important. So Paul says after this list of important exhortations to really listen to, he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Claire and I were having a discussion this week about contentment, and she had some really great thoughts. And, and, and one of the things we started talking about, um, that sometimes people can believe in this, this, this way that contentment is almost settling. That like if we get content for a minute, that that's no good. I don't mean lazy. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not talking about being lazy and saying, oh, yeah, this is good enough. No, but having contentment can sometimes uh, make people feel like, oh, am I settling? And, and that's not true. They're looking for something bigger, grander, more elaborate, and saying, well, you know, look at this one. Look at what they're doing. I, I'm not doing enough. Um, and yet, sometimes that the reality is, is that we have to learn the secret of contentment. Paul's going to unlock it for us right here. If I enjoy where I am, we sometimes think this, that I must be doing something wrong. That's not true. That, that might mean you are called to be right where you are and that peace of God is walking with you and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And so don't look at other people to compare with. Don't look for that justification from somewhere else or somebody else. God's the one who's walking with you. Let the joy of the Lord be that strength that keeps you where you're supposed to be going. And so I'm going to jump to 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. I'll put the verse on here. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, he's going to warn Timothy in, in, in 1 Timothy about the love, of, the love of money and how that's a dangerous road right in those same verses. But he starts by saying godliness with contentment is great gain. So when you're walking with the Lord and you're content, like, you know what? Everything's okay. God's got this. I don't have to freak out and worry. All right. I'm going to be all right. That's great gain. Isn't that a wonderful place to be? To be in that peace that transcends understanding? And so let, let's realize what Paul is saying here. Now, there was this stoic philosophy at the time when Paul is writing in the book of Philippians that oh, God's will is just whatever comes, comes. What it is, it is. There's nothing I can do, right? And there's still that, that 
statement. I've seen people have plaques that say, it is what it is. And I've said it myself. But the idea was that, oh, that, that, that must be a, a good way to think. that you know. And Paul's actually working in contrast to this thought. Let's jump back to Philippians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. He says, I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. Both sides of the pendulum. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things. Uh, I'm sorry. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And we know that him is the Lord Jesus. That's who he's referring to. And, and so this verse isn't just to be arbitrarily attached to anything that we're doing. Oh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No, no, no. In context, Paul is saying, I lived on both sides of the fence, on both swings of the pendulum, plenty and need. And you know what I can tell you? I can handle it because God's in control. I can sit back and go, okay, God's got this. Remember the list he just gave the church in Philippi? All this whole list, rejoice, uh, wait for God's peace. And then that list of what should be filling our minds. And so right away, this is the reality that we're in. I can handle this. Yep, it's a pandemic. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's making me content. He's giving me the joy of the Lord as his strength, as my strength. And so I'm okay. God's got this. That's the strength that you need, that I need. That's the strength he's talking about. So there's a source a peace, joy, hope, and rest. It's found in Jesus. And with that understanding, I'm strengthened. I can face anything. God's got this. Yep. It's hard to say it sometimes. It's hard to visually see it. We could say, oh, everything's chaotic right now, but God's got this. My outward circumstance may change, positive or negative. God's still in control. We need to start to see uh, life from God's perspective. We sang that song earlier, build your kingdom. God's building his kingdom. That's important. He's not going to stop. Are we going to get on board with that? We're going to start to see our life from that perspective. How am I building God's kingdom? What am I doing to add to his kingdom? Here's what I want you to do. Here's what I encourage you to do. Here's what I exhort you to do. Focus on what you're supposed to be doing. Are you single? Let me talk to the single people right now. Because I know this is a time where you have felt super lonely. And I understand that. But the reality is, this is where God has you right now. So what does he want you to do with this time? What does he want you to do with the ability to be, to be freed up and, and, and in this state? Are you married? Oh, you're not freed up. What are you supposed to be doing? Are you a parent? Are you a worker? Are you a student? Are you a friend? What are you supposed to be doing? Now do it with the strength that Jesus gives you. I can handle this. God's in control. I'm not going to get overwhelmed. I'm going to walk in his peace. And I'm going to have that strength. We already said it many times. And that strength is going to be my joy. It's going to keep me anchored and settled to say, it's hard to smile right now, but God's got this. Let's detach ourselves from the non-essential. Detach from the non-essential. This whole series is about essential. That means we have to detach from the non-essential. What does it matter? Are we finding this out? I mean, this is, I don't even know how many days this has been or where you started counting, but it's been over a month. What are we detaching from that doesn't matter? Are we letting that fall off to the wayside and say, you know what, that doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Here's the things that are truly important. I mean, kind of wrap up with a couple of questions. What do you do when you worry? What do you turn to? Answer that question for yourself. You don't have to say it out loud. You're probably in a living room with other people that you're related to. But think about it. What do you turn to when you worry? Often we run after, let's say, better possessions because it's a longing to fill emptiness inside. That's why some people need to have the latest iPhone, the upgraded this, the newest this, because we're trying to fill a void that can't be filled with stuff. What fills you when you feel empty? Some of you have been stressed. Some of you have been, uh, felt abandoned. Some of you feel 
all alone, what do you turn to? How can you truly find contentment? The answer lies in your perspective, your priorities, and your source of power. These verses have encouraged us to redirect ourselves to who Jesus is, what he's done for us, to, to sometimes take that perspective of Jesus has got this. The power we receive from Jesus is enough to follow and do his will, his plan for our life, and then face anything that comes along with doing that. Okay, I'm supposed to be a parent. Then be the best parent God called you to be. Let him equip you. Let him strengthen you. Okay, is that it? Yeah, that's not a, that's not a low-grade calling. That's a huge high-grade calling. Uh, I, I, I'm single, okay? God's calling you to be the best representation of who Jesus is, where you are, and what you're facing. Here, I want to wrap up with Paul's source of joy and strength. We're going to go backwards in the book of Philippians to chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. I'm going to read through here. It says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and the basis of faith. This is nothing we could ever earn. I love this quote. I'm going to read it to you. It says, No amount of law-keeping, self-improvement, discipline, or religious effort can make us rich with God. It's only what Jesus has done. Jesus it, it dies on the cross for us. And, and his righteousness, his perfection, replaces our sin. It washes it clean and that's what God sees now. He sees what Jesus has done. Not what we've done, but what he has done. And I, I wonder if you've been running after the non-essential. Even in the midst of this. Maybe we're online looking things up. Maybe we're, we're running after the things that don't matter still. And so let this be a wake-up call for us this morning. We started on Easter asking, is Easter essential? We're ending this series on communion and how important communion is. Remember, Jesus called us to repent. The definition I love of repent is a change of mind followed by regret and a change of conduct. Now, Jesus helps us with that process, but we have to want it. We have to be willing. We have to admit, Lord, I've sinned. I've messed up. I need you. And so I want to close this time out and pray for you briefly. And then Pastor Joe and Gabby are going to join us and share some other words about communion and lead us in this time. Lord Jesus, I'm so grateful for your word. I'm so grateful that when we open our heart and mind to who you are, you, Holy Spirit, make the Bible come alive and be the living, active book that it is. It challenges us. It changes us. And so, God, I pray that each and every person that is watching this right now allows you to do the change that only you can do on the inside. And may it come to affect the outside the way that you want it to. And get our mind and heart fixated and focused. Let us celebrate let us realize the joy of the Lord is our strength. You've got this. May we celebrate in this communion time of what you've already done for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, True Light Church. Uh, this is the first time I'm making my appearance on True Light Church online. So I just want to welcome you. Uh, to our time of communion together and we might be uh, alone we might be with family uh, during this time uh, but I just really want to encourage you wherever you're at whatever you're doing right now to just take a moment as we reflect on this crucial part 
of our walk with the Lord, and that's communion. So I'm going to give some instructions, and I'm going to give you a moment, uh, if you haven't uh, already, grab some uh, communion elements, and that's the bread and the cup. And if you haven't done that at this point, go ahead and do that. And I'm just going to do a little bit of teaching, and then Gabby's going to play a song of worship, and we're going to move forward uh, with our time together. But the first thing I want to uh, draw your attention to is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, we get some instructions on what communion really is. And it's bringing us to a remembrance of the Lord's Supper, where Jesus was with his disciples, and he was having this final uh, dinner with his best friends, and he was communing with them. He was hanging out with them, and he was about to give them a lesson uh, in what he was about to do, and they didn't even understand this. So the first R of communion I'm going to talk to you about is remembrance, and it's remembering what Jesus did. And that's what these symbols mean. The bread is his body, which was broken for us. And when we remember that, we remember that he did something for us that only he could have done. And then we have the cup. I got some lemonade in here, uh, but that's irrelevant because when we remember what the cup stands for, it's his blood that was poured out for every single human, every single person. And when we remember that, we realize that Jesus has done something that we can't do for ourselves. He has laid down his life and he, his body was broken and his blood was poured out so that we can receive this commun communion with God. Once again, this community with God and we learn how to love and we learn how to uh, really understand what it looks like to be in right relationship with people and God because of what Jesus did. So the first R of communion is remembrance. The second R of communion is reflection. And we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that Paul is calling the church of Corinth to a time of reflection. This is what he says. For I pass unto you that what I received from the Lord himself. On the night which he was betrayed, Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So there's that remembrance. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this. In remembrance of me as often as you drink it for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes we're going to talk about that verse in a, just a moment but right after this it says so anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord that is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are sick and weak, and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So my dear brothers and sisters, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. If you are really hungry, eat at home so you won't bring judgment upon yourselves when you meet together. I'll give you instructions about other matters when I arrive. So, so Paul is calling the church of Corinth to a time of reflection. And I want to give you this opportunity right now. Maybe this quarantine has been a time where you've really drawn close to the Lord. And reflect on that. Why is that? Why is it that during this time that when we have so much more time, we're more willing to spend time with the Lord than before this quarantine? Reflect on that. 
And if this quarantine has been a time where you've maybe taken a few steps back and maybe you've been struggling throughout this time, I want to remind you about what Jesus did and what that means for you, that you can have this close communion with God. And he desires to be in that relationship. And that's why we remember what he did and reflect on that. Reflect where you're far away from God right now and take this opportunity to draw close back to him. To ask God to forgive you of the things that you need forgiveness of. To ask God to give you uh, that closeness that you so desire to be close to him. Take that time. Take a moment. Take a moment with your family. Maybe there's some... uh, Things that are going on in the house that you need to make right. Reflect on that and make it right in this moment. That's what this time is about, is reflecting what Jesus did and how that applies to your life today, right now, every moment. And then the third thing that we sometimes don't really talk about when we talk about communion is this part of rejoicing. And This is twofold. The first part is rejoicing of what Christ has already done. So we see that. We see the bread and the cup. And that represents what Jesus did. But then we also are rejoicing this next part, where it says in verse 26, For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. You see, communion is... Is twofold. It's recognizing, remembering, reflecting, and rejoicing what Jesus has already done, but it's also rejoicing that he is coming again soon. And he's coming for his people. He's coming for his bride. He's not forgotten about us. That this temporary moments that we're here on earth is only temporary. And there will come a day where he is going to come again. And what he did on the cross is going to reflect in our lives. And it's going to be a representation of who he is here on this earth. And then he's going to take his bride home to be with him once again. There's a rejoicing that takes place at what Jesus did on the cross because it's a reflection of what he's done, but yet what he's going to do. It's not finished. But one day we'll be together with him again, and we can rejoice in that. So what I want you to do right now is I'm going to pray. And I already gave the instructions, but I'm going to give them one more time. And I want you to take your bread, and I'm just going to read these verses. So it says, For I pass unto you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread. So take your bread in your hand. And he gave thanks to God for it. And just begin to thank God for everything he's done for you. Thank God that he's given you this opportunity. And then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So I'm going to take some time and reflect for a moment, and I'm gonna pray, and then we're gonna take of the bread together.
God, we thank you that you gave everything for us on the cross. Lord, it says in your word that your body was broken for us. Lord, we know that by your body, Lord, and what you went through on the cross, that we are healed by your, by your stripes. We are healed, God. And because you were broken, Lord, we can experience this life in the way that you intended it. So, God, we thank you for that. We love you, we honor you, and we praise you. And in your name we pray, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take of the bread together. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. So I want you to take the cup in your hand, and I'm going to pray, and then we'll drink together. Lord, I thank you for your blood. God, because of your blood, the stain of sin is washed white as snow. God, where we are so imperfect, your blood is covers that imperfection and brings in your perfection. So God, we thank you for what you've done on the cross. And we ask you today to remind us, help us to reflect, and help us to rejoice in what you've accomplished on the cross so that we can truly experience this life in that joy of knowing what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's drink of the cup together. So at this time, we're going to transition, and Gabby's going to play a song of worship. And I just encourage you, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, to worship the Lord. And do it with a heart of joy, knowing what he's accomplished through his act on the cross. Love you guys. See you soon.